how we start it off. So it's 6.30, welcome to the Pasco School Board of Directors regularly scheduled meeting. I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, we had an interesting study session this afternoon on social emotional learning supports that'd be available on YouTube. Uh, Ms. Maria Goble and Al Ms. Al Alice Amaya gave us a great presentation on social emotional supports that they're working on and especially an interesting um, project that they're taking on to have uh, tele telecounseling available for all students. So if you're interested in that social emotional supports and what the district's doing, please check out that study session. Uh, next we'll move on to the flag salute and we have Columbia River Elementary here for the flag salute. Are they with us? Not with us? Okay. So we'll have the uh, student board reps lead us in the flag salute this evening. Next on the agenda, we have roll call. Ms. Richardson, please call the roll. Present. Present. Excused. Present. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. Next, we have the approval of the meeting minutes from the regularly board, regular board meeting from January 11th, 2022. I would entertain a motion. Mr. President, I move to approve the regular meeting minutes for our meeting on January 11th, 2022. I second. There's a motion and a second to approve the regular board meeting minutes from January uh, 11th, 2022. Uh, all those in favor, please say yes. 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 Opposed? No. All right. Motion carries. Next, number five, we have special recognition this evening. We have board appreciation, and we have Ms. Anna Tensmeyer here. Thank you. Good evening, Board President Lehrman and members of the board. In recognition of School Board Appreciation Month, celebrated each January, we would like to take the opportunity to honor and thank our Pasco School District Board of Directors, made up of parents, students, educators, and professionals for giving their time and talent to make PSD the best it can be. School board members play a crucial role in promoting student learning and achievement by creating a vision for the school district, establishing policies and budgets, and setting clear standards for accountability. They are also committed to ensuring every student in the district reaches their full potential. These last two years have been a testament to not just the students' abilities to adapt to their constantly changing environment, but also to our school board members who work diligently behind the scenes to make the educational experience the best it can be for our students in a time where, no where normalcy isn't always accessible. They are extraordinary people who voluntarily tackle the enormous job of governing a school district and do so in a manner that illustrates what it means to be resilient, ready, and relentless for all those they represent. Board meetings are just a fraction of the amount of time and energy that our board members devote to leading our district. There are seminars, conferences, and training sessions that regular, they regularly attend to keep on top of the latest trends in educational leadership, classroom teaching methods, and much more. They are deeply involved in community activities and spend many hours in the schools at, and at extracurricular events. Thank you to each of you for taking the time to share your leadership and voice about the future of our students. To honor your contribution, to Pasco School District, we will donate books to every school library in the district. Inside each book will be a sticker with your names listed to let students know what the book, that the book was donated to honor each of you. This year we purchased three books that were re recommended by our librarians. So to start, our elementary schools will receive copies of a book that's been ordered in English and Spanish, which I think is for the first time, which we're very excited about, titled Strictly No Elephants by Lisa Manchev. In this best-selling picture book, the local pet club won't admit a boy's tiny pet elephant, so he finds a solution, one that involves all kinds of unusual animals. 
Strictly No Elephants has been sold around the world and is heralded as a pitch perfect book about inclusion. Imaginative and lyrical, this sweet story captures the magic of friendship and the joy of having a pet. For our middle school students, we have a book titled Everything Sad but is Untrue by Daniel Nayuri, described as a sprawling, evocative, and groundbreaking autobiographical novel told in the unforgettable and hilarious voice of a young Iranian refugee. And for our high school students, we have a book titled Akata Woman by Nettie Okorafor, which is the third book in the series that started with Akata Witch, named after one of Time Magazine's 100 Best Fantasy Books of All Time, and 100 Best YA Books of All Time. So at this time, we would like to acknowledge each of you with gifts coordinated by principals Dora Noble, Armando, Armando Castrellon, and Chip Elfering. You will also be presented with a certificate and copy of the Governor's Proclamation. So thank you again for all that you do. Does anybody from the board have anything they'd like to say? Yeah. So we signed up for this position for the grand pay that we get. You all know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. We, uh, so this is one of the few times that we get recognized, I, I, you know, formally. People are always saying thanks, at least to me. I don't know about you guys, but we do appreciate your, your uh, recognizing us and Thank you for the work that you do. It, uh, it makes our job a lot easier when, when we have good administrative staff. So thank you for recognizing us and thanks for these gifts. All right, thank you. Thank you to Chip Armando and Dora um, for representing the principals, representing everybody for recognizing us for us. I, my fellow board members say it, it's a great honor to serve the community for all of us to be entrusted with two of the community's greatest resources with tax dollars and with the education of our children. Um, we appreciate everything you guys do, everything the staff does, everything the uh, parents do, and the community to make sure that our students have the best experiences here. So again, thank you from us to you for putting us in this position to serve. All right, next we have uh, agenda item number or six is the agenda review. We did have one change to the agenda. Um, we will not be presenting the ESSER funds report that will table that to the meeting on the 8th. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we'll be uh, requesting an executive session under 4231101G for personnel and superintendent evaluation. Thank you, Ms. Whitney. All right, item number seven is audience comments. In a moment, I'll open the floor up here in the boardroom to those who would like to make comments to the board. We ask that you keep your comments to two minutes. Uh, Ms. Ms. Thornton will keep a timer there, or Ms. Richardson, and we'll uh, let you know when a minute and a half is up and when your entire two minutes is up. Uh, I'll call on you. If you have the comments you'd like to uh, make, please raise your hand. We'll go up there and then we'll give um, our custodian a moment to sanitize the microphone in between each commenter. And after we're done in the in the room here, we'll move online to see if we have any commenters that would like to comment via Zoom. So is there anybody who'd like to make a comment in the boardroom here? And then please state your uh, name and any affiliations you might have with the Pasco School District. Mm. Michelle Andrews and proud grandparent of three students in the Pasco School System and two great grandchildren that are three and four, so they'll be entering very soon. Um, I did listen to the social uh, emotional learning piece and I see on one hand great promise and on the other hand great concerns. I felt that there was not enough um, specifics as to when a student gets a referral and what it's about and specific is about uh, which, men which things qualified as mental health and which mental health. And so what I would encourage the board to do is to do another survey directly to the parents, directly to you 
and of the students directly to you so that you, you've had a wonderful proposal by these ladies that have worked incredibly hard. I don't want to step on your toes at all. But my most important concern is that families are held together. And counseling another person's child is, it, it is a careful consideration. And so knowing, I, I would feel better if parents had a chance to meet the counselor first, especially if you have a blended family and you have a child that's going between two households, both of those families need to be okay with the counseling. Um, it, I, I think sometimes if you took these masks off kids, you would see their anxiety level go down tremendously. And I do encourage you to start thinking about making that stand because it's becoming more and more clear. 145 countries have left the, um, the mandates because uh, they're not making any difference. Shots and, and uh, masks are not making the difference that, you know, without then those that did not have them. Sorry, I stumbled there, but um, please consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Saunders. Uh, hi, my name is Jason Hart. I'm a Pasco parent. My kid is a sophomore, actually a Delta, but we live in the Chiawana uh, district. I'm also the head swim coach for the guys at Pasco and Chiawana. Um, I'm here to advocate in the next bond when we build a school to include a, a competition pool. Um, last time I came in here and I talked about water safety and all that type of stuff. This time I want to talk about um, the fact that when we... Uh, had, in 2013, we had a bond for the city, and in Franklin County, they actually, we actually had 57.8% of the vote to support said bond for the aquatic facility. Now, what I'm suggesting isn't something like that. That one had water slides and all that type of stuff, and, and we marketed to the voters that that's where you'd make the money. Um, if you have a competition facility and what it does for our schools, um, as far again, I talked about water safety and the importance of it last time. Um, the support would come in terms of the travel and tourism that it would bring in. Um, I, I'm, our team's going to Kelso. We're spending the night in a hotel for two, two, for two days. We're spending several thousand dollars as a school district to go over there and do that, plus what, what extra the kids spend. That, all that money adds up when you have something like that. And, you know, I spent 20 years working for the Kennewick School District, and it was, they're great. But the amount that PASCO supports their, their kids, it's not even close, man. Um, you, you, we transport kids to a facility that we rent. And my ask is, why don't we just uh, put it in the bond, get the support, sell it, market it, and from there, um, from there, why don't we be the owners and not the renters? You know, that's always what we tell people when they buy houses, all right? That's my two cents. Thank you for your time. Appreciate you all. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Is there anybody else in the boardroom who'd like to make a comment to the board? All right, seeing no hands raised, Mr. Garrett, do we have anybody on Zoom who'd like to comment to the board? We do have a Zoom attendee that'd like to make a comment, Ms. Heather Kubalik. You are up and your microphone is unmuted. Hello, thank you um, for this opportunity to speak. Uh, as he said, my name is Heather Kubalik and I am a parent of seven current PASCO students, including two high schoolers. I was also on the committee that created the long-term facilities management plan. I listened to this discussion at the last board meeting about when to run the next bond. Uh, one timeline suggested was November, 2023. I implore you to move faster. I know how much work was done to create the bond that we were ready to pass in November, 2020. The district has asked the board if they want a full scale rework of that bond or just a refresh. I am in favor of a refresh. The major need on the 2020 bond was a new high school. The current capacity of our four high schools is 4,577 students, brick and mortar. The long-term facilities management plan uh, projected a 2021 high school enrollment of 5,858 students. And we have surpassed that with an actual September 2021 enrollment of 5,905. I don't think we need to spend months reworking the information. We need to act. 
What was needed in 2020 is needed even more in 2022. I would love to see the bond, next bond election in November 2022 or February 2023. The community knows this bond has been in the works for a long time, so I don't think we need the 18-month marketing plan that was mentioned. I'm sure the financial costs of construction have changed, so let's get those numbers worked out and then move forward. Our students need this bond now, not in 21 months. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kubot. Mr. Garrett, is there anybody else on Zoom that would like to comment? There are no other individuals wishing to make a comment, President Lerman. All right, thank you, Mr. Garrett. Agenda item number eight is the consent agenda. On the consent agenda, we have personnel, warrants, overnight student travel for Pasco High School, DECA students to attend the state competition for DECA in Bellevue, Washington. And we have the Stevens Middle School Replacement Construction Change Order number 013. I'd entertain a motion. Mr. President, I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. I second. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there any discussion? All right, hearing none, uh, Mr. Richardson, please call the roll. Mr. Lerman? Yes. 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 All right, motion carries. Next we have action items of which we have none tonight. And agenda item number 10 is reports. Uh, the first, the first uh, topic on the reports tonight is the Superintendent Student Advisory Council report. And we have our student board representatives. And it says on here, student liaisons as well. So uh, um, if you guys, before you talk, wanna each introduce yourself and tell us which school you go to. Um, good afternoon, Board President Larry and members of the board, Jason Asadu from Pasco High, and I'm here to present you the report from the Student Advisory Council meeting from January. We opened up our January meeting by educating our council members about the local levy. Um, we struck the importance of the difference between levies and bonds in the simplest form, such as <coughs> levies are for learning and bonds are for building. and. We also talked about what would not be funded if the levy did not pass, as well as stressing that the levy is not a new tax and it's the replacement of our current levy tax. Hello, um, my name is Jasmine Ojeda and I attend Pasco High School. Um, at our last advisory council meeting, we talked about the Voting Rights Act. Um, we learned about it and we talked about how it provides a free and a fair election opportunity for all the community. Hello, my name is Brooklyn Arroyo and I attend Chihuahua High School. So the major follow-ups of the Superintendent Advisory Committee is addressing, of course, something we've been talking about quite often is the social emotional support, mental health and wellness and how they the focus for that is a concern for students, especially considering the impacts of the pandemic right now. So the biggest point and the biggest takeaway is Ms. Alice Amaya um, research training opportunities for teachers and has invited a consultant from Association of Washington Student Leaders, or AWSL, to join February, February's advisory meeting. I personally have worked with AWSL to help with curriculum development and other training um, that students have worked to develop, so I think that they would be a great resource for us in Pasco School District. Hi, I'm Jennifer Wally and I go to Delta High School. Um, the last thing we talked about at our student advisory meeting is the naming of the new transportation facility. And um, I think all of the council participants um, were in favor of renaming the facility after the bus driver that was that passed um, a couple months back, and this is the QR code to that survey. So thank you. 
Any questions? Any questions from the board? Yeah, so there was a, uh, when was this meeting? Was it, was it this year? Yes. So it was just a week or so ago, a couple yeah. weeks ago? Yeah. Okay, good. So the, was there good participation, lots of input from the students? You talked about four different subjects there. Did they, were they pretty engaged? It was a lot more of a learning um, kind of meeting rather than um, everyone putting in their input. We, I could tell there was a lot of new information being taken in where people had not known what a levy was or what a bond was or you know what had to go into the mental health uh, field or anything like that. It was a lot of people learning a lot of new subjects. Yeah, I bet it was. And I, yeah, it's probably not fair to ask you what everybody's input was there because there was everybody was learning. But yeah. But yeah, that sounds like a great uh, opportunity for you guys to learn about some of the things that we've been dealing with as a board. And, and uh, I, I'm, I'm sure we're invited to these as a as a board member. It would be. It would be worthwhile to go and see one of these one of these times, I think, and just see the interaction there between the students. But Our next student superintendent student advisory council is February 9th. Um, we start at 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, lunch is served, and in the February meeting, we always have breakfast for lunch in honor of Valentine's Day tradition. So please come and join us on the 9th at noon. The meetings last till 1.30. Um, and like I said, this is our traditional breakfast for lunch in celebration of Valentine's Day. We'd love to have you. Are they here? In the Correct. Okay. Yeah. So how, how many students attended this last meeting? About? About, I think it was about 10 of us. I think Ten? 10 all. And from all different high schools as well. And remind me, is it freshmen through seniors or is it yeah. mostly junior and seniors? Fre it's freshmen through seniors, but usually it's a lot more um, juniors and seniors that show up because they can drive themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the board? Good job. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for representing the students. Appreciate that. So well, I'll ask you guys. We're 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 taking comments from to the board on our normal reports. Do you guys want to see if the public has any questions for you? Sure. Any any questions from the public to our students? No, you got one. You, you can just you can just ask it from there. Yeah. I do think that surveys are going to be the best way for us to get everybody's input, you know, to uh, to someone to someone where it matters and to someone where they can make the change. I do think that surveys are going to be a really useful tool in us trying to find that information and to get you know to get to know what people really think. Thank you. Any other board member, uh, students want to say anything? No um, pressure. Uh, much of what you're saying about sort of making sure that the students have their voices heard through surveys or any other method, um, we did have a lot of discussion in uh, before in our study session. So um, many of your points were already said by the board members and we're thinking along the same tracks as you. 
Um, as for masks, I think that it really just comes down to this is more revolving around the lifestyles we're going through. And of course, masks, we've never had to deal with this before at this scale. But I think that it's more about developing a system that will continue to exist after the pandemic has subsided. So less of a focus of asking students how we feel about the masks because we are not mental health experts, but more about addressing issues that have existed before, during, and will continue to exist after the pandemic. All right, thank you. Thank you, students. All right, next we have report B, educating students in a COVID-19 environment. We have uh, Ms. Sarah Thornton, Ms. Michelle Whitney, and Mr. Raul Satal. So while Ms. Thornton is making her way up, we are, um, Raul and I are abdicating our time to <laughs> Sarah. Sarah will be the sole presenter tonight. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Board President Lehrman, uh, Superintendent Whitney, and board members. We have another COVID update for you this evening. Uh, tonight, I will provide you with another update on the community case rates and also share some information regarding ways in which the district has been mitigating the impact of staff absences throughout the system. As you know, we've had a very uh, high case rate over the last couple of weeks. I'd also like to provide you with some, an update regarding our testing programs and specifically uh, information regarding the test to stay protocol. So this is the most updated uh, slide from the Washington Department of Health for statewide public health information. This is the 14 day case rate per 100,000 as of January 11th, uh, 2022 and it, as you have seen on past reports, usually what the Department of Health has been able to do is predict based on incomplete data what the next week or so of data is going to look like. They have been so inundated with cases that they are not caught up to that point to be able to do that with the inputting. So from our last report on the state data, we know that they were expecting the state cases to peak at 2,999, so 3,000 cases at the state level as of uh, January 14th. And so as of January 11th, we are at 2,300, or I'm sorry, 2,732 statewide. And they were then anticipating that the state rate would start to fall and be down to 2,200 uh, per 100,000 by the 19th of January. So by those dates, and I think we'll see this borne out at least preliminarily in, in the uh, information that we show you here in a little bit, uh, we, we are hoping that we are past our peak. Uh, the, the data is not quite caught up to that but we believe that we've reached the peak of uh, the COVID cases over the last couple of weeks. Same with the Franklin County data. We don't have uh, data that predicts out what the, the anticipated rates would be yet, but as of January 11th, we were at 3,039 cases per 100,000 anticipating a peak of 3,700 cases by the 15th of January and down to 3,000 by the 18th of January. So again, hopeful that we are just now through that peak season and we'll see those case rates uh, hopefully drop. What's that number on the far right, 3,000? On the graph? Yeah, It's 3,039.5. Right. So it's the same number that's at the top of the slide. And that's as of January 11th. Are you an average? <laughs> it's an average per 100,000. Oh, right. We don't round. 
So this is some updated information regarding our reported district cases. The week of January 10th through the 16th, we had 593 reported student COVID cases and 115 reported staff cases with 78 reported close contacts. And again, this is information that is either confirmed by us through our district testing or reported to us by staff and parents. The week of January 17th through the 23rd, we had 630 reported student cases an uptick in reported staff cases to 161 with 38 reported close contacts. So as a close contact, refresh us, um, are you out on a quarantine for all close contacts or is it testing based, vaccine based? What, what happens to a close contact? So there are three different things that could potentially happen to a close contact. And, and if you don't mind, Mr. Lehrman, holding the question, I think that when we talk about the test to stay program and the protocols there, that we'll talk about that. Okay. We've continued to see significant impacts uh, through both our instructional and operational systems. And tonight I'll be uh, showing you data with our concerning our teachers, our paraeducators, and our bus drivers. So our teacher absences the week of January 10th, we had 969 teacher absences. Of those, 770 substitutes were requested, which gave us a fill rate of 36.75%. The following week of January 18th, we had fewer teacher absences and fewer substitutes requested but we still had a 34.43% fill rate. We've also struggled with our instructional paraeducators. 420 were absent the week of the 10th with 372 substitutes requested at a 13.71% rate of filling those positions. And January, the week of January 18th, 341 absences uh, with 261 substitutes requested. So it has been a struggle at the buildings to fill the positions where we've not been able to secure a substitute. And there are several ways in which our buildings have been mitigating those impacts. Uh, at schools where there is space available, classes have been combined uh, so that in an auditorium, for example, uh, at the high school or other spaces where students can be working on lessons and staff can be assigned to those spaces to assist with supervision. That's also been a strategy that they've been able to employ at some elementary schools. We do continue to have certificated staff and administrators who are otherwise assigned to district level functions. We've been uh, asking them to deploy out to the buildings and cover either in classrooms or cover supervision and playground duty. Uh, that's been the other uh, chief way in which we've been able to mitigate those. But it, it has been a struggle for the buildings. R uh, principals right now and through the month have been routinely uh, substituting in the buildings and participating in that substitute rotation so that classes can be covered. We have been trying to uh, add more substitutes to the pool and so employee services in coordination with the special services department, excuse me, that's Tracy Wilson's department and public affairs held a successful job fair recently for paraeducator substitute candidates and they are also holding zoom information sessions for community members to be able to become emergency uh, certified substitutes we've <coughs> held several of those last week and have more scheduled and hope to be able to work with individuals who are perhaps parents or and and have a degree who would like to substitute maybe one or two days a week 
or uh, other individuals who maybe work for a Hanford contractor and don't work on Fridays would perhaps be available to substitute on a Friday. So those are uh, different ideas that we have been trying to implement in order to beef up that substitute pool. But in all honesty, what's going to help us the most is a decrease to the rate of cases. And again, we're hoping that we have peaked and that this starts to improve over the next couple of weeks. The other area where we've been very hard hit is in transportation with our transportation staff absences. These are the numbers here displaying the total weekly driver absences. And keep in mind, we already are at, we, we don't have the number of drivers we would normally have. So normally we would have about 120 bus drivers. We're, we made the routes this year with approximately 90 bus drivers. And so we, we don't have a big margin to be able to absorb absences and routes that can't be covered. And so what drivers are doing is covering the, the routes where there might be a driver absent, they're covering those with an existing driver. And so this means that a driver is having to cover and drive multiple routes in a day. And the way that that works is that route is added on top of the route that they've already driven. So while those routes are covered, the pickup and drop off time for the students can be significantly impacted. And we have heard from parents over the last few weeks that there is very much some, some frustration out there in the community about that. Uh, and we do appreciate their, their patience and flexibility as we work through this particular wave. No question on that one. Mm -hmm. I, get, I get two texts a day from Giovanna and McLaughlin that both of my students' buses are gonna be late, and that's what the frustration from parents is, I'm sure. <laughs> How does the 90 bus, so you have 90 bus drivers, I don't know what that weekly driver absence means. Is that routes versus bus drivers? If you only have 90 employees, how do you have 150 out in a week? So some of Is those would be day? covered by substitutes. So what, what percent on average are you missing per day? Do you have 50 drivers there per day? So there were 37 drivers out on Friday. So okay. out of the 90, 37 were out. These are weekly absences, so that's over five days. It's okay, not so 30, one driver. 30 employees are 30 out employees. per day? Yes. So same basis. About, yeah. 90 dri about a third of our drivers are out at any given time, so half of the, thir half of the two thirds that are in are driving two routes in the morning and the afternoon. Okay. Yeah. Any of those routes that can't be covered by substitutes, and I know the Department and Employee Services has also been working very hard to try to add additional substitute drivers, but there are very specific training requirements that you have to go through before you can you can get that license. So it's it's been a struggle. The absences have also impacted some of the communication mechanisms uh, for the department in the office staff. They have designated office staff who will field parent phone calls in English and Spanish and who will route and assign buses. And over the past couple of weeks, there have been several absences within that cadre of, uh, of people as well. So, so we have had uh, district office staff deployed out there to assist. Uh, Mr. Story has been out there quite a bit over the last couple of weeks. Mr. Satal, I believe, uh, was fielding phone calls uh, one morning uh, out there as well from parents. We're doing the best we can as a system to help backfill uh, to be able to deliver those services. So another, and I spoke with Miss Whitney about this one, but another spot, it, I think that one's hitting not, not only in kids being late home every day, there's some of our students here that do extracurricular activities. These, these, these guys drive their seniors. I think most of you guys drive, if not all of you, right? But we have extracurriculars sometimes happening at, play, at schools in Kennewick and Richland <coughs> for you know freshmen and sophomores at 4 p.m. And there's some parents that are having difficulties getting their kids there because they may not have seniors on the team or juniors on the team that can drive the parents are working so anything we can do to 
I don't know, use our small small um, class C, is it called, or any, any options, or move those, those teams and those activities that have younger kids to later times um, would help some of those parents out as well, I think. That's a great suggestion, Mr. Lehrman. I know that they are, um, they deploy when they can the vans. We have uh, fairly large vans <laughs> that require, that don't require a CDL to be able to drive them. And our, our labor partners have also been um, very helpful to help us make as many drivers available for work as possible. Uh, and we do appreciate everything that they've done as well to try to work through the problem. We, we are expecting that this is a temporary problem, but we do acknowledge the significant impact of it. One thing that we were able to implement on the uh, 17th of January is we began providing COVID, Sunday afternoon COVID testing for staff. We started with drivers, bus drivers on the 17th, and I'll um, talk in a minute about the uh, second um, opportunity that we had last week. But what we saw there is we were able to test drivers who had either been identified as a close contact or were, were feeling ill. And they, we did have a certain number who did test positive for COVID and they couldn't work, but those who did not test positive were able to return to work. And so uh, we're trying to implement more opportunities like that to try to return as many people to work as possible. And so that brings us to the discussion on testing, starting with our positive test rates and the district tests. So beginning the week of January 10th, we had a 16.9% positivity rate for with uh, just a little over 2,000 tests administered uh, within the district. One of the questions that you had at the last board meeting was of those tests, how many of those are athletics? And we're administering about 1,700, between 16 and 1,700 tests per week at the high schools and middle schools to support student participation in athletics. The week of January 17th, we saw an uptick in testing in the district, 2,600 tests with a 20.2% positivity rate. And again, that coincides with the timing that we expected from the state, epide I can't even say the word, from, from the state data, the, the state COVID testing data, that coincides with where we expected to see the peak. And if that model holds true, we're hoping to see those rates start to decrease over the next couple of weeks. The last line on that chart is the event that was held on Sunday, the 23rd of January at Edgar Brown Stadium, EBS stands for Edgar Brown Stadium, uh, where 122 district staff members were able to come in and test. 49 of those individuals tested positive, and so that was a 40% positivity rate. But we were pleased that the remaining individuals were able to then return to work on Monday without uh, having to quarantine because they were a close contact or had potentially been exposed to COVID. So we're hoping more events like that will help mitigate the absences as well. You can tell I've got a question. Yes. <laughs> so on these tests, the um, <clears throat> you've got two weeks of data there. Are these tests that are being administered by the school, are they symptomatic people or are they close contacts as well? All of the above. Okay. Well, and we, we don't uh, differentiate. A, a majority of them, it looks like, have to test. Out of your 2,000 or your 2,600, 1,700 of them, have to test just every two days for athletics. Yeah. They're not testing because they're symptomatic or are worried about COVID. They're testing because they want to participate in their sport. I was just about to add that. That's correct. So that 1,695 is included in the other tests? Yes. Okay. So you're not tracking whether they're symptomatic or close contacts and what the different positivity rate is in those. Is that, is that correct? The case managers are tracking 
on an individual basis when they are inputting and creating cases for both close contacts and for symptomatic individuals. I'm not sure though, Mr. Christensen, if we are specifically tracking down to that level of detail in the tests that we are administering. Some of the people who we case manage didn't take a district test, they took a test through their physician or, or some other type of reporting. Okay. Now those who are testing, I'm assuming that the athletes are not coming to school sick, so hopefully they're all asymptomatic, but we don't know the positivity rate on those. I do they're, they're not, not differentiate it out there. I, I do not right now. I can see if we can get that for you though. Hopefully by the time you get that it's a moot point and we don't need it. But um, I, I'm just curious to know. I, I mean that, that data is not, uh, I mean we hear a lot of talk about COVID and high positive test rates and so forth. But the data that's meaningful I think to, to people who really want to understand mm -hmm. it is, is not reported for whatever reason. And it is, it, it, it's tracked differently than, than what we track from case management. Uh, so I think that's part of the reason that we don't have it as, as readily available. I do yeah. know that the impact of the athletics testing has been an issue when it comes to COVID testing supply, which I am I'm, I'm gonna get into in, in just another couple of slides, but th that's probably where we've seen the bigger impact is just ha struggling with the availability of tests, yet still having to administer those athletic participation tests. What, what do we know about outdoor sports? If, if we were in our spring season now, would outdoor athletics have to be tested every two days as well, or is there some kind of waiver there? I don't believe that we have that guidance yet. That'd break you, wouldn't yeah. it? You got bigger sports track and mm -hmm. soccer and everything going, yeah. We're hoping that with uh, specific uh, efforts at the state level, I know that there are individuals locally and at the state level who are advocating with the Department of Health to modify that requirement because it has become so burdensome on families and on districts and because the supply of tests is so stretched, we want to be able to prioritize those tests for students in the classroom. And so there is an effort, I believe, to advocate that way and we're hoping to see that change. So as I just mentioned, the availability of tests is, uh, is an issue for us, um, both uh, because of high demand in this current spike of cases and because of low supply and supply chain issues across the nation. We administer not athletics, but around in, in our buildings and at the district level, we administer a, um, over 1,000 tests per day right now. And we have test orders for tests from December um, that weren't filled. So we are struggling at this moment to ensure a steady and continuous supply of tests. The ESD did step in a couple weeks ago and organized treks to retrieve cases of tests from the west side of the state that were caught up in distribution. Um, the state has now consolidated the uh, disbursement of COVID testing supplies to districts through the ESD and tried to centralize that. And so we're hoping that through that system, our supply of tests will be, um, will, will, will be better. Um, but even at the state level, I think I put a note there that the Department of Health today on their website indicated their inventory was out of stock. So this is not just an issue for school districts, it's, it's inventory is, is an issue everywhere. How does the how does the administering a thousand tests per day align with the chart you just showed us previously that we had two thousand or twenty six hundred tests per day or per week? Sure. So the week of the seventeenth to the twenty third, for example, would be our, our most recent data week. If we're administering about sixteen hundred 
on average tests through at athletics. The remaining thousand tests are tests that we're administering, um, administering around the so district. So those are not one and the same. The, the 1,700 per day is not part of the 2,600 total. It's in addition to? There may be an error on my slide. So 1,000 per day would be 5,000 per week, and then our chart says 2,600 per week. Yeah, I will all have to reconcile that, Mr. Learman. Okay. I'm not sure why that discrepancy. Thank you. So we are, because of the supply issues, we are taking uh, steps to try to better regulate who we are testing right now until our supply is uh, steadier we're going to be limiting our testing to students and staff only uh, when we first began school-based testing we were testing family members as well um, siblings or parents in the household we're limiting that at the moment until we can ensure we have enough tests for students and staff um, and to be tested that student or staff member um, aside from the requirements for athletics, they must need to be tested to be allowed to remain at work or school. We are going to continue for with uh, Sunday afternoon testing at Edgar Brown Stadium for staff, and then centralize our testing for students and staff uh, during beginning the week of January 31st. And so we will also be at Edgar Brown from 10.30 to 1.30 and that would be available to uh, families with PSD students who need to test to either remain in school or return to school and staff members. And then I believe, Mr. Lerman, this last slide will get to the question that you had previously about what the requirements were for quarantine. And the requirements for quarantine are impacted by a couple, uh, several different factors, uh, one of which is whether you are an individual or a student who is fully vaccinated or not. Quarantines apply to close contacts and someone who is not vaccinated would be required to quarantine for uh, a period of 10 days someone who is vaccinated would be eligible to return from a quarantine after five days with a negative COVID test. The test to stay protocol is another mechanism that would allow an individual who is otherwise required to quarantine to participate in what the state calls a modified quarantine. And what this means is if they meet these criteria, they could uh, be permitted to attend school and school-related extracurricular activities, but they would have to participate in COVID testing at least twice during the first five days of quarantine. So if they test at the beginning and then test five days into quarantine and they are negative, and they have no COVID symptoms, they agree to wear a mask, they would be allowed under the, the test to stay protocol, they would be permitted to return. So hypothetically, <laughs> if a, a younger kid that's five or six years old, I don't know if it matters if they're vaccinated or not vaccinated, and they got called, the parents got called and said, your kid had a close contact at school, can we test them? And they test one time that day. Is that, does that meet this requirement? It seems different, but. That would be, day, that would be counted as day zero. They could go to the district testing site. They could be tested. And if they are not symptomatic, uh, and they're able to be mask compliant and their test is negative, that would be their first test. They would then come back on day five to be tested again and they would be able to return. But they have to go quarantine, mm -hmm. vaccinated or unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. okay. 
we were anticipating when we were notified that we had been approved for the test to stay protocol and it is something that you have to have approval from the department of health to do we were notified right before winter break that we were approved we were anticipating being able to implement that early in january and have that fully up and running with our current case rates and uh, all of the other factors right now, um, especially the lack of, of testing materials, we have not been able to fully implement test to stay yet. So we're going to start uh, with the buildings as another absence mitigation measure for staff and on, a, on, a, on an availability basis for staff. Other staff and students who wish to participate in the test to stay protocol, if they meet those criteria, can, can go to the open testing that we have at our setting up the week of the 31st at Edgar Brown. And if so, if a child goes to the school and the school either doesn't have supply or they don't have staff available at that time to do the test, the parent could be referred to the uh, drive up testing at Edgar Brown to be able to do that. that is the update for this evening um, are there questions I can answer or additional information I can get for you I just have some comments there that I, I so I think what we've seen and as it's been predicted by uh, the State Department of Health, we're gonna peak here. If we haven't peaked already, we're gonna peak. So we don't, we don't have the latest data, so we don't know what it's doing, but the forecast shows that it was gonna peak this week, I think, is, is where we were at. So it's been interesting to see this. I know a number of t people who have tested positive for COVID. And some of them have no symptoms, most of them have minor cold symptoms, sore throat, congestion. A few of them have had uh, severe cold symptoms. <clears throat> and I think one maybe reported some flu-like symptoms, aches and pains. Most of them are relatively minor. Yet they're testing positive. So for me, that says one of two things. Either these tests are worthless in predicting what, what uh, in determining whether it's COVID or a cold and maybe, or COVID has just come down to a cold now, which would be a good thing. So it's, it's frustrating to me that we're going through all of these hoops to protect ourselves from the common cold. Worse is that if it is COVID and it's highly contagious and the vaccine doesn't stop it because many of the people that are testing positive have been vaccinated, then we're not going to get through this until everybody gets it. So, and if it's a common cold, what, uh, what, are, what are we doing? So, it, to me, this is very frustrating and doesn't make a lot of sense. So, if you could, uh, and I don't, again, I don't know that it's worth it, but I would really be curious on our athletes, because hopefully they're not, they're not sick, how many of them are really testing positive? That would be helpful information, I think, for those who want to know, because we're, we're wearing masks in this room and the unlikely event that one of us has COVID or, or multiples of us have COVID. Because if we're sick, we shouldn't be here. So if we, if we don't have COVID, uh, I mean, if we're not testing positive, then, um, or if we are testing positive and, and don't have it, either way, that would be useful information. So uh, to me, it, it, it's, I'm, I'm really sus suspicious of these tests and how effective they really are in predicting whether we're going to be really harmed by COVID because I've not heard of any hospitalizations among the people that I know and I've, I've heard of quite a few that have COVID. And um, so I'm, at some point, we've got to move on beyond this COVID thing. So I'm, I'm ready. I'm there. I'm ready to be done with it, To, to uh, especially if we're getting to the point now where it's just a common cold. 
And if we're all going to get it, let's get it and move on. So, thank you, Sarah. I think the uh, the only thing I would request is information on really testing, and I think the athletes would be a great place to start because they're all supposedly healthy. How many of them are testing positive? Any other questions or comments from the board or the student board reps? Thank you, Ms. Thornton, for that update. Um, I'll open it now to, to the community to ask us any questions you have on this topic or make, actually make a comment to the board. We'll keep it brief, two minutes or less if you have one. I think it's important um, to know that both the common cold and the corona COVID-19 are the virus are both all coronaviruses. They've never been able to, to mitigate the cold. And that's why I want these masks removed so these students can go on with their lives and, and recover and just find out what it's like to laugh and smile and see the smile back. And we're talking about mental health today. Um, it is a common cold. And it was a terrible thing and, and we can't just go on cases. We have to go on state data that says 98% of the people that get this do recover. Some are hospitalized. 98% out 7,000 some odd out of 7.7 .7 million people and that that's not a pandemic anymore and I know in Washington State we are inundated with pandemic 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 but we have to look across our country which I spend most of my day doing after having worked at a TV station and and looking up reports and stuff that we actually there are lots of data in other countries and other states watch Virginia folks because this is not helpful anymore. So I'm with Mr. Christensen. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Andres. Uh, good evening, school board. My name is John Kennedy. I'm a Pasco uh, school district resident. Um, it's been reported in the press about the Yakima School District in terms of them having to go entirely online because of their high case rates and uh, staff not being able to be in the classroom because of the COVID, uh, because of the COVID case, case rates. So I was wondering what kind of um, preparations is our school district doing in case that we don't level off, in case that our numbers continue to go up or if there's a, if it plateaus and then it, it skyrockets in the near future, uh, are we doing any preparations, planning for a worst case scenario in which some type of, some type of hybrid or fully online uh, uh, program is required? Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Um, please, please uh, write a couple sentences to Ms. Whitney and or the board and, and we'll have an answer there. I know, I, I think, I speak for myself, I think I can speak for the board and district staff and most of the community that we wanna keep our kids in school at this point. But if you have additional questions on what kind of preparations are being done there, um, send that email to, to Ms. Whitney and her staff can <coughs> answer that. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just say I appreciate the comment, Mr. Kennedy. I think that's something that the community is interested in as well. So I thank you for bringing that up. And if we could just shoot a quick note certainly get a response back to you and, and uh, might be worth making that broad with it. Right now. Anybody else comments on this topic to the board? Okay. Again, thank you, Ms. Thornton. Uh, last report that we have on the agenda for tonight is C, the State of the Schools Review, and we have Ms. Mira Gobo here. Good evening, Board President Learman, Superintendent Whitney, and the members of the board. I am here to share with you kind of a sneak preview uh, of the upcoming State of the School Review scheduled to begin mid-February. Um, mid 
So um, the presentation um, is designed to, tonight's presentation to give you a tour guide of what each school will be sharing with you during the presentation that you will attend. The purpose of the State of the School Review is really to connect the dots from our outrageous outcomes to school improvement plan. I call it kind of a nested goals, um, plans by highlighting the data alignment. The visual here that represents um, the effective systems of progress monitoring at the district level and at the school level. So this fall, we came before you and presented the progress and monitoring data at the district level around the outrageous outcomes. Now you will have an opportunity to hear each school building and share data story and its alignment to the Pasco School District's outrageous outcomes and our vision. My goal tonight is to really share what you might expect um, during these presentations. So I want to kind of start with this definition, the Outrageous Outcomes Progress Monitoring, um, as well as the State of the School Review, is a system. Um, one of my favorite quotes, um, and I'm, a, I'm doing a lot of um, audibles, and I'm kind of a book junkie that way, is by James Clear, who is the author of The Atomic Habit. He said that, that you do not rise to the level of your goals but you fall to the level of your systems. No matter how lofty your goal is, if you don't have systems to execute, then it's just a, a wish. So, I mean, I think our systems that we have in place to monitor progress, um, I think it, um, that system actually supports that. So the effective system, um, the reason that we have it is to really reduce variability. Ultimately, we want to provide equitable learning experience for all of our students, no matter what school they attend. Um, the way we work toward that, that ultimate vision, is to really create systems of goal setting and progress monitoring that are describable, predictable, and replicable. Um, so I'm going to give you an example because I'm the last one to present tonight. One of my favorite examples of effective system, I would say, is a, is a popular one, is example of Starbucks. That I know that in order for me to acquire the outcome, my favorite drink, which is skinny caramel macchiato, when I order that, it is describable, um, but no matter what Starbucks I walk into, it's also predictable that I'm gonna get the drink that I ordered. Um, and that's not by default, but it's by design. Everybody's trained, and I know that's a simplistic way to explain this, but I think it is really important that we make sure that our big goal and all the school level goals and the PLC goals are all nested and they're aligned um, for the same, same outcome. So during this um, presentations, what you will learn, expect to learn, is that you will hear how site level academic goals are aligned to the district goals and stretch goals. You will also hear about how various building level strategies and activities that are designed to achieve the goals. The framework for continuous cycle of improvement, um, we will utilize the plan, do, study, adjust um, what is our plan, what will we do to execute that plan, and what does the data and evidence tells us about our plan and work, and what adjustments do we need to make to, to, uh, to our plan. And then you continue to um, cycle through that um, and keep going. Um, I want to add that this year, as you've just heard, has posted um, some challenges to this process. For one, the, uh, the various reasons, but one, that there's been some lack of assessment data from last year, because we just didn't provide all those assessments you usually get. But our schools are working on our fall data to create some plans because we can't wait until COVID to end to continue with our education. Um, so I know our principals are working hard to prepare these presentations. Um, they've already signed up and selected dates and time. Um, and we're gonna invite you to sign up to attend um, these presentations. Um, the strategic data use. So the key part of what you will hear is a school level data. So um, here are some series of data that you will be hearing about. So some of the comprehensive needs assessment. You're gonna hear about demographics of each school, who are the key leaders of each school. One of the data that we have presented in the past, Washington School Improvement Framework data, um, that is not available at the OSPI level. The last data that is uploaded is from like three years ago. So instead, we'll be presenting fall SBA and uh, star reading and math data, which is what we came to present to you to talk about outrageous outcomes. So that's the data that our schools will present. 
They will also share with you our English learner data and their learning, um, learning achievement, um, as well as our outreach outcomes benchmarks and monitoring indicators. They will also share our CEE, the, the perceptual data and readiness to change indicators uh, will also be shared with you during this presentation. The other part of, this is probably new addition that we didn't have to do a couple of years ago, is how each school is addressing the accelerated learning and learning loss recovery efforts at the site level, really focusing on the, the tier one instruction, which is a presentation that Ms. Lobos made a couple, couple of weeks ago, um, how the standards are narrowed and utilizing formative assessments, and so what is happening at the building level, as well as how we are meeting the social emotional learning needs of all of our students. Um, another addition to this year's presentation is if our outrageous outcomes are our what, that's the goal we want to achieve and really embedded into is our why, our belief in our students, the 100% no exceptions. But our district's five priorities are really the how, that these can be levers that it can move the dial for student achievement. So you're going to hear updates from each of the schools where they are in their implementation journey on AVID, uh, multi-tier support system, social emotional learning that um, Isamaya has talked about earlier, that is what's happening at the school level, as well as dual language, professional learning communities, and high school and beyond plan. Now, some of the schools said they have not started this journey yet, but it is a five priority, so I think it, you'll hear the where they are and when they expect to start um, using, really utilizing this high priority as a lever to move uh, move us forward. To add to that, we're going to come back around to you and present on each of these five priorities in, as a district level where we are. Like in, um, in February, I'll be in front of you to talk about AVID, and then we're going to talk about MTSS as those five priorities at the district. Um, kind of a landscape of where we are, um, we'll come share that with you. So um, to kind of wrap up today's presentation is really logistics. As I've mentioned, the principals over ha already have selected dates. The first presentation, I think, is Pasco High School on February 14th. All of these are happening after school. Um, the presentation will be 30 minutes with 10 or 15 minutes of question and answer at the end. Um, that we're going to ask, you know, put hopefully one or two board members at the most will sign up to attend um, these state of the review presentations, um, stretching from February, mid-February, all the way to, I think, the last is sometime in May. So for the next three months, you get to be in schools, and um, and I hope that you give a lot of kudos to our principals, like Ms. Thornton talked about. They've been substitute teachers and <laughs> other things. Um, but I know that they are still I focused on student achievement and meeting the needs of our students. So with that, um, that is a little bit of preview of what to expect when you attend the State of the Schools Review. Are there any questions that I can answer for you before I thank, leave the podium? Thank you, Ms. Global. Any, any board members or student board reps have questions, comments? Yes, we're looking forward to it. Yeah, I hope you are. I am too. It's been, uh, yeah, we took a break last year yeah. because of COVID. But uh, when we did start this a couple years ago, it was right. So we yeah. started we started this in what 2020 right before the pandemic we got through almost all schools board members were able to attend i think mr campus had just joined the board the board in concert with district leadership staff had talked about this probably starting in when 2019 2018 maybe after wasda and some other yeah. stuff and and it took a year or two to implement and we were able to get out there in 2020, winter of 2020, and it was inspiring to see the work. And so we're excited to get back out there in the next couple months here and, and start this back up again. So thank you to the staff and thank you, Ms. Goble, for this intro or reintroduction, I guess it'll be. Sneak preview. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, this evening agenda item number 11 is an extended study session or discussion. We don't have anything there. Uh, future agenda items, Ms. Whitney. So we have scheduled a zero-based budgeting uh, study session on February 8th. A consultant will be joining us. This is an extension of our efforts around the Government, Government Finance Officer Association School 
best practices in school district budgeting. We've brought that concept to you at various times over my six years as superintendent. The zero-based budgeting process is part of that work and the, with the work of the consultant, we're excited to operationalize or get refocused on operationalizing those best practices. So huge kudos to Kevin Hebden for finding a consultant that really does specialize in school district budgeting. Um, he's already met with staff a number of times and so it, it's his opportunity to meet with you as a board so that you're clear about the work that you're doing with him and um, answer any questions that you have. Then during the board meeting, uh, we'll have a report to you. We did uh, walkthroughs of uh, sampling of our school district site, looking for ways to separate our school bus traffic from parent pickup, pickup and pedestrian traffic. Um, as a result of the tragedy that we experienced at Longfellow, our um, insurance crew came in to go block these with us and they have a set of recommendations we'd like to share with you. We will have an extended study where we're bringing back bond information based on the conversation two weeks ago and we'll be having Mary describe. She'll be in front of you to talk about our one of our five top priorities which is added. Thank you, Miss Whitney. Uh, next, we have board communications. So we'll go ahead and start with Mr. Simmons. Well, I'll just I'll quickly say I, I enjoyed our study session today, and um, I was really impressed with our, our student reps here and the questions that they asked. I thought they were very well thought out and um, helped, especially me, understand what we were uh, discussing, you know, gave a better understanding to me and also their perspective from a school uh, student's perspective on how the, these, these programs would help them. Um, another thing I wanted to draw attention to also is, uh, as of right now, I, as far as I know, there is a um, survey on the state uh, Board of Health uh, s websites, a questionnaire concerning uh, COVID vaccinations for uh, school age children and the requirement of vaccinations to attend school. So um, if that's something you have an interest in filling out, um, I just wanted to bring that to people's attention. Other than that, that's all I have. All right. Thank you, Mr. Simmons. Mr. Campos? Yeah, I'd just like, again, to piggyback on what uh, Mr. Simmons said about uh, this afternoon's uh, study session. I'm excited for that. And I think our schools are definitely needing that kind of services uh, for our students. Um, I'm also excited for uh, what's next in February and, and the next three months after that is the state of the, of the school and so district. And uh, I'm just excited for that and to see what our schools are doing. Thank you, Mr. Campos. Mr. Fisher. Yeah, so just for your information, fellow board members, this coming Sunday is legislative conference. And this is where we used to go to Olympia and meet with, uh, well, we'd have some presentations on Sunday afternoon. And then on Monday, we would go to the Hill and meet with legislators. Since it's COVID, that's changed a little bit. This one is going to be virtual again, like it was last year. Um, there will be presentations on Sunday, I think, and, and we have to sign up for that. That's not, uh, that's not just show up. There is a cost associated with that, but I don't think it's too late if you're interested in, in hearing what they have to say. And then starting next week, I don't, when, I don't know when our first meeting is, but instead of day on the hill, it's kind of week on the hill and it's all virtual again. We'll be meeting with them remotely. If you're interested in meeting with any of the legislators from our, the 16th or the 9th district, um, let me know and we will, did you submit something there? I, we have to sign up. Okay, yeah, so let Jenny know so you can get, uh, get signed up and you'll have to get a Zoom link from them. So it's, so let her know. And one other thing, so ballots came out, I think it was last week, we started getting ballots for our levy measure. Um, I'm, not, I'm not gonna tell you how to vote on that, but I, I've heard some conversation about 
not voting or voting no because of masks and and I um, I would just say before you do that think about the consequences of that because we have no control over these masks as a local district we can't we can't just say we're not going to wear masks or we would lose a lot more than our levy so so uh, if you're inclined to do that give it some thought before you before you make that decision. Thank you, Mr. Christensen. I was gonna say the same thing. I was just gonna say we're, we can't tell you how to vote, but your ballots, uh, if you're a registered voter, should be in the box and they're due January 8th, uh, the same date as our, sorry, February 8th, the same date as our next regularly scheduled board meeting. So look for those ballots if you're interested in voting. And then I also wanted to say I saw in the news um, one of our fe fellow past board members, uh, William Leggett, Bill Leggett, passed away a couple weeks ago, week, week, week and a half ago. Wanted to thank him again for his service, thank his family for allowing him to serve both on the board and, and as district staff um, administration in the district prior to his time on the board. I think the way that the elections were, you know, eight years ago or something, I think I came in and served maybe one or two, as I was appointed, one or two board meetings with him. So briefly served on the board with him for a couple board meetings and, and spoke with him. And I know there's many people in this uh, district to honor and appreciate his service to the district. So again, in memorandum and thank you to his family for uh, supporting him in his service. Uh, Brooklyn. Thank you, Brooklyn. Jason? Um, I would just like to thank um, everybody in this room for listening to our presentation and my presentation. It was really good for the group here. I think it's really good to have a representative from the Bradley Council. And as well, thank you for the support for the recognition that I feel like you have support in the commission line. And um, just to the love you like to live, I'm watching your calendar with this group here. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. Jennifer? still pushing through we're still teaching kids and we're, st we're making the best out of our situation every day and I know that's hard and I know there's been a lot of sleepless nights for everybody in this room and everybody through the school district so thank you for you know still caring about us students and making sure that we get the best education that we can thank you Jennifer Miss Whitney did you have anything all right, next we'll move on. Uh, we, we have an executive session under 4231101G personnel and superintendent evaluation, and we expect that to take uh, one hour. We'll say one hour. And uh, with that, thank you for joining this, uh, us this evening, and we will recess into executive session. <laughs>